Mark chapter 13, and as I always do, I'm going to read the entire scripture out loud, the entire chapter, and you can follow along silently while I read Mark chapter 13, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son. And children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment, but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter." For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you all things. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. Ye know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors." Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey." who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would please uh, help me to expound upon your words. I pray that you please speak to our hearts and our minds. Lord, give us the understanding that we need. 
please uh, uh, help us to learn this morning. I pray that you would just help me to teach and to preach. And I pray that um, you just help everybody to not have any distractions this morning, but that we can all be in our Bibles and intently uh, ready to listen, ready to learn, and ready to hear your words, dear God. Just please use me as your vessel to be able to instruct and, um, and to do so in truth, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now the title of the sermon this morning is The Beginning of Sorrows. And you might have noticed that in Mark chapter 13, as well as in Matthew 24. Matthew, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, they're all parallel passages of uh, the sermon that Jesus Christ is giving here. So you can compare the three, and actually we're going to be looking at all three uh, briefly this morning. And the reason why, you know, what I'm going to be preaching out here with the title being The Beginning of Sorrows, uh, verse number 8 is where that met the title comes from here in Mark 13, where it says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrow. So in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, it's all the same context. It's the same conversation. It's the same sermon. It's the same teaching. You know, Jesus Christ uh, is confronted by, well, first he says uh, in verse number one, he says, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. So his disciples are pointing out the temples, how beautiful it is, how great it is, you know, and kind of, of, of pointing out the, the workmanship on the temples. And Jesus answers and says, well, hey, do you see these things? There's not going to be one stone left upon another, right? They're pointing out these great buildings. And man, this has been around for a long time. You know, this, is, this has been established. This is here. This is great. And he's saying, that's all going to be destroyed. It's all going to be knocked down. So that prompts his disciples to then ask the question and say, well, well when is that going to happen? Right? And they go further. They're, it's not just the destruction of the temple. They're asking, you know, and especially in Matthew 24, because, you know, even though these are parallel passages, they're accounts given by witnesses. So the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, you got four different accounts, four different eyewitness accounts to these events. All of them under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. God using them and speaking through them and God's word being written down. However, there is still a human aspect to this that, that is, is coming from each of the people. And, and it's amazing. And I want to get too in depth on, you know, the the... God's word being, being perfect and true and how he uses man and how that all comes apart and still being able to be without error. I don't want to dig into that because it's, it's beyond the scope of the sermon, but it is amazing the way that God works. It's similar the way that God uses man to go out and, and lead people to Christ, how it's God's word that brings life. It's Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life, yet he uses man as an instrument to go. And if man isn't going and doing this, people aren't going to be saved. God yokes up with man in many ways to get spiritual work done, but he relies on us to, to, to give ourselves and to yield ourselves to be used of God. And in so doing, you know, man has some little bit of influence on the way that things are done, even though we're not the ultimate life giver, if that makes sense. So when we preach the gospel to people, we don't, uh, you know, not everyone says the same things. We all have our own ways of explaining things, but we're still all using scripture. We're, we're using God's word. We're helping, to, to helping people understand that in various ways. It's the same truth. The word of God is bringing life, but, but we have our own, I don't want to say spin. It's not a spin on it. It's, we, have, we have our own impact and influence kind of being added to that without taking away from the truth of God's word. And in a similar fashion, I believe that's how the, the, you know, these books of the Bible, how God uses man to give us his words and the truth. So you have varying accounts within the gospels, but they do all harmonize. There is no conflict. There's no contradictions between the accounts, but what one person writes and what in, in the description that one person gives isn't always identical to the other description of the person. Now, they don't conflict with each other, but you get different bits of information from the different writers 
as to whatever you know they are putting in there at the time everything that's written here is true in all of the accounts but sometimes you get more information in one than another or different information, but it's not, it's not a contradiction of, uh, you know, it's not like one person said, well, he said this, and the other person saying he said that, and they're two different things. It's in some accounts, you just get maybe an extra statement that was made that the other person didn't record, didn't, didn't write it down, even though it was actually said. That makes sense. So obviously there's a lot of things that Jesus Christ said that wasn't written down when he was with his disciples. I mean, you think on a, on when he was growing up on a day-to-day -day basis, he's having conversations with people. He's a normal human being in the sense of like interacting with people. But we don't have all of those words. Likewise, when he's teaching and preaching, you know, he's teaching great truths. We don't have every single word written down of every sermon he's ever preached, every teaching he's ever taught to every single individual he's ever spoken to, right? So when these accounts are being written, we don't have every single word all the time of everything that he said, but when you go through them all, you know, that's why we have a little bit of variation, but they're still all true and they're all perfect and inerrant. That makes sense. So anyways, I, yeah, I, don't, I, I went a little bit too far on that. Wasn't even planning on going that deep on this, but the reason why all of this is important, this is interesting, is we see that the disciples ask, well, when is this going to happen? In Matthew 24, you get a little bit different, a little bit more information where they say, um, because in, in Mark 13, uh, they ask in verse 4, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? In Matthew 24, they say, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So, that little bit of information wasn't included here in Mark 13, but that's why when we look at all of them, you could get the full picture of everything that's being uh, spoken and asked. So um, why is that important? Well, because there's a lot of people who, who hold to a preterist view of, um, of events, and they'll look at Mark 13, Matthew 24, and they say, see, he was, they're just asking about the destruction of the temple. We know that already happened in 70 AD. We know that, that the, whole, you know, the, the, the temple was destroyed. So this is all, the, all of this stuff has already happened. And they take a, a view that everything that's prophesied in the whole chapter is just like, well, it must have already happened. Because he was just answering that question. It's not true. What, what we find very frequently in Scripture is a dual prophecies. There's prophecies that will be given for a short term as well as for a long term event. We see that very common in the Old Testament as well as even here in the New Testament. And we have overlap sometimes. Now, there are events that are listed here in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, you know, talking about the sun and moon being darkened and the stars falling from it. You know, this is a great event. And we know, we know this hasn't happened yet. So you have to be able to reconcile just, just pure reality, knowing like this event did not happen to, to be able to say whether or not you can say, well, all of this is, is, has already happened or not. Now, we know the destruction of Jerusalem has happened, but, and, and it lines up with, with what he's saying here. But as you study this, you, you could look at it and say, okay, Obviously, these things are happening because he's talk, he, he's the one who brought up the stones being knocked down. But they had also asked about his coming and the end of the world. Now, it doesn't matter. The disciples might have thought this is all one event in their minds when they asked the question. But it doesn't matter if that's the, what they were thinking because the way that Jesus answers them is knowing that they're separate events, that when, the, when that temple gets destroyed, but then when he comes back and the end of the world, they're, they're different things. So he's giving them information on all of this stuff and, and, and the answer to the question. And even though they mean maybe because, because of their limited understanding, they're thinking it's all one thing, he actually gives them the full, the full picture. That, hey, there's this destruction coming, the Son of Man's coming, and then the end of the world. So there's... There's, there's all of this stuff that's given to them. I, I would liken it to Acts 16, right, where you've got the jailer 
who asks, you know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, when he asked that question, because he was worried about the punishment that he was going to face. That's why he was going to kill himself, because he thought all the prisoners had fled. He's going to kill himself because he's so worried about the punishment that he's going to receive, since he was the one, uh, you know, responsible for everybody, all the prisoners. And if they all escaped on his watch, well, who knows what's going to happen to him. So he's worried about himself. He's worried about his flesh. But when they answered him with, what must I do to be saved? They answered him with a spiritual answer. They answered him with, hey, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in the house. They're, so their, their, their response was one of, you know, the, the most important salvation, which was his soul. He was, may have been asking, thinking about his flesh, but they answered with, with a much more important answer that was still answered the question, but it was a, it was a it was a much more important one. And I think the same thing's happening here with Jesus Christ. Like they're, at, they're thinking from one, one point of view with their limited understanding and Jesus gives them the full and the, and the, and the, the perfect answer for them, of course. Now, um, at the end of Mark 13, we see in the last verse, he says, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. And even in verse 35, he says, watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So all of these events, they ask about end times events. They ask about the, you know, the coming of Jesus Christ. And over and over again, we see Jesus answering them and telling them, don't let people trick you. Don't let people deceive you. This is an important event and God wants us to know these things. Now, I know that there's still a lot of confusion in general amongst Christians by and large today about end times events. And obviously hindsight's 2020. We're never going to have the perfect view of everything that's going to happen. It's a lot easier to look back and say, oh yeah, this scripture is prophesied and, and fulfilled here and we can look back and see how everything's already played out because it's already done. There's no more question at all of, of what's going to happen when it's already happened. So obviously there's going to be still some m maybe misunderstandings and room for error and doubt and just kind of question on what's going to happen in the future. But this isn't something that we're completely left without information on. And we do have very good information to know a lot about what's going to happen that we don't have to be ignorant of. This isn't some big question. Now, some of the details, sure, there's going to be questions on how exactly everything plays out, but there are major events and milestones that Jesus has given us because he doesn't want us to be deceived because it is important. Jesus Christ's return is extremely important and we are not to be in doubt, we are not to be in fear, we are not to um, be ignorant of his coming. And in fact, he says, you need to be watching. So he gives us all of these details and says, now watch for this stuff. There's things that we need to be looking for. And I'm not going to go too in depth on, on the timing of the rapture. I've done that in plenty of other sermons, proving that Jesus Christ is not just going to come back at any moment as if there's no precursor, as if there's nothing else that needs to happen first, that just like today, maybe Jesus Christ is going to come back and we're all going to be raptured. That is a false teaching and it's demonstrated very easily. I mean, just common sense, if you just take a step back, forget about maybe what people have taught you in the past and, and what you've been led to believe by a man, Look at what the Bible's saying here. They're asking about end times. Jesus, and, and again, we'll get through, we read the whole chapter, but if you go back and reread it and, and look at the other passages, Matthew 24, Luke 21, he's giving them a lot of details and then says, watch. Watch for this stuff. Why would he say to watch if no, if no Christian, no believer is going to be around for these things? And I've heard the argument where people say, well, he's just, you know, he's just talking to the Jews here. This is only for Jews that are going to be around and they're going to go through these tribulations. And, and, but all the, the Gentile believers are going to be raptured out. That argument, especially in the New Testament, makes no sense. In the New Testament, it says there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. That, that we're all one in Christ. 
and that if you're a, a you know if you're a believer if you're a child of promise as Isaac was you know we are children of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ that that's you know that that they that are of Israel are not they are not all Israel which are of Israel the Bible teaches I mean over and over again we're seeing that what God doesn't care about the genealogy that's why the New Testament says avoid genealogies it doesn't matter we don't need to go back and prove any lineage, lineage and God doesn't isn't looking at lineage when he's giving all these warnings of things to come and about Christ's return. And that's why he ends Mark 13 saying, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Not I say unto all Jews. I say unto all. God knew that this is his word that's going to be preserved for generations to come. God knows the timeline of events. What he's saying here, it's not just meant for his disciples. It's not just meant for one little small group of people. This is meant for all to watch. Watch, because he gave us things to look for. Okay? Now, that was kind of a long introduction. The purpose of this, and the reason why I called my sermon the beginning of sorrows, is because of events that are happening now, and I think a lot of people start to wonder, and this happens, it seems like, almost on a yearly basis, that people are, are, are watching and are looking for, well, well, are we in the end times yet? Is this, you know, kicking off? So, when we read these chapters, there's a lot of things, and we're going to get into that too. We're going to go to Revelation 6 a little bit later and see really what the Bible's describing as being um, all the events that we need to be looking for that are for sure going to happen and before any rapture happens. So we're going to see those events, and those events haven't happened yet. We have not seen any of those events happen yet. W the closest we can be right now is in what's known as the beginning of sorrows with what we're seeing happening. So let's look at that. Because Jesus did say to watch, so let's read some of these passages and see, well, what should we be watching for? Now, I have to reiterate this. No matter what we are, you know, in our watching, in our looking, this isn't a fearful looking for. You know, we're not, we're not supposed to be scared or afraid of trouble to come, of the end times, of any of that. We, we have no reason to fear at all we should trust that the lord can see us through tribulation that the lord will help us and help us to do great exploits and 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 he's capable of keeping us safe yes there's going to be trials and tribulations but it's nothing to fear we fear not what man can do unto us so we're not looking at this through the lens of of being scared we're looking at this through the lens of, well, Jesus told us to watch. Let's be well prepared for these events. Right? We need to be strengthened. We need to know what's coming. It's only going to help us as trials come, as tribulations come, to not be scared when we know in advance this is what's going to happen. And then as you see it unfold, like, this is exactly what Jesus said. This is happening according to his word and should only increase your faith and increase your courage and edify you more as you see God's word coming to pass. It's just reinforcing, yep, the word of God is true. I don't know about you, but just in my day-to-day -day life, um, obviously it doesn't happen every single day, but sometimes you witness things, you see things, events happen that just bring to mind scriptures as truths from God's word. And, and just every time it's just reinforcing, oh, yep, that's true too. Yep, that's true. Oh, yeah, I remember the Bible said that about these people or about those people, whatever. And it happens. And you, and you can see it happening. And the longer I live, the more I experience that. It's all just more strengthening of my faith because I just see God's word ring true over and over and over again. And the same should be as we get into end times events. Um, we're going to start seeing things happen. We're be, we should be prepared for them because we've studied, we've read, we've listened to Jesus, we listened to his warnings. And it's not going to offend us. It's not going to bother us. It's not going to make us get scared and run and hide. But rather, it should strengthen us to do even more because the time is short. 
That's why we're, we're studying this and looking at this. Now, with all of that in mind, let's take a look back here. Uh, we're going to start reading verse number four, excuse me, in um, verse number five, where the Bible reads, and Jesus answering them began to say, take heed lest any man deceive you. Jesus doesn't want us to be deceived. He doesn't want us to be tricked or fooled into what's going to happen in the future. He says, I'm going to tell you. Verse six, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse seven, and when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Now, I'm going to say this too. He starts off bringing up just the fact that there's going to be wars, there's going to be talk of wars, rumors of wars, you know, great wars, but the end is still not yet. And I think the reason why he brings this up first is because especially when you read in, in the prophetic chapters of Daniel 9, 10, 11, you're going to see the what's brought up the most is like these wars okay and even in revelation we see wars we're going to see in revelation chapter 6 that there are wars that are going to be taking place during these you know at you're kind of starting off the tribulation but he's saying just in general though just because you see wars he said that's going to happen and that doesn't even mean you're you're starting anything yet there's going to be wars there's going to be rumors of wars and history has already told us this right christians throughout history haven't necessarily, you know, known what to expect. We don't know exactly what to expect. As far as I know, I mean, I'm going to be long dead and buried before Jesus comes back again. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I think it's going to happen in my lifetime. I don't know that. Christians throughout history have often thought it's going to happen in their lifetime. We see different things shaping up. But um, regardless of when it happens, we still need to watch. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared so that if it is going to happen in our lifetimes, we are ready. Now, let's keep reading here. He says, uh, wars, rumors of wars, verse 7, be not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Now flip back over to Matthew 24, please. And we'll look at this again in, in Matthew 24. So what we see is the beginning of sorrows. He says wars, rumors of wars. And then he brings up earthquakes, divers, just, just different places, various places, kind of all over the world, so just, just earthquakes. Um, you know, potentially even in places that don't normally have earthquakes doesn't exactly say that, it just says in, in diverse places, in various places, earthquakes, and there should be famines and troubles. Now, the reason why he's bringing this up, I think this is to show that as we get into or closer to end times, I think these are going to be ramping up, that it's actually kind of, it's somewhat notice, notable that these beginning of sorrows begin because there's always been famines and earthquakes and troubles throughout history. I mean, there's always been, right? Um, and there's always judgments of God. There's always things that are being done. But what he's giving them information on, at first he's, he downsplays the wars, just saying, look, th there's going to be wars and everything else. And then there's going to be these earthquakes, famines, troubles. But he said, this is still just the beginning. You haven't really gotten into... The, the hardcore end time tribulation stuff yet. Um, and when it comes to where we are today, like, well, there's this pestilence, right? There's this, this disease. Is this, is this the end times? Well, maybe you can say we're in the beginnings of sorrows. Things are going to start to ramp up. Maybe we're going to start seeing famines. Maybe we're going to start seeing some earthquakes. I don't know. But... Um, as we get into this, you're going to see, well, we're not, we're still not that far along and into thinking like, oh man, well, is the Antichrist going to be coming tomorrow or something? We're not, I don't think we're there yet. Look at verse number three in Matthew 24. Bible reads, and he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the, uh, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, excuse me, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. 
For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. These, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Um, so again, we see virtually the same things being mentioned, except this one actually mentions uh, pestilences as well, which wasn't mentioned in Mark 13. So we can be looking for famines, pestilences, earthquakes, diverse places. But this type of information is not enough for us to, to get you know, freaked out about because these things happen. And he's not even giving much detail on this. He's just kind of saying that these things are going to happen and that's sort of the beginning. And I think the world is going to be kind of moving towards this, this great tribulation and we're going to start to see things getting worse and worse. Uh, I'm going to read this for you. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to read from Luke 21 which is another parallel passage. Verse 9 says, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. He doesn't want us to be terrified. He doesn't want us to be scared. You know, even at talks and rumors of wars. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And I'm not going to get too far into Luke 21 because I think there's dual prophecy going on there where the disciples of the time are, are being brought before kings and they're, you know, for the preaching of the word of God, that's physically like actually happening to them. But I do think that this is also going to be happening in the end times as well. That there's, you know, we know that there's going to be persecution against believers and that people will be arrested and slain and, and uh, martyred for the cause of Christ. So that's, this is where I think like in Luke 21, you, you start seeing a lot more of the dual prophecy going on. But like I said, I don't want to get too deep into that. Now, um, I know I do turn to Revelation chapter 6. But before I go too deep in that, I wanted to, to just briefly go through Matthew 24 because while I have been focusing in on the beginnings of sorrows, uh, it's, it's just a real simple concept. I want to go, if you can, to flip back, keep your place in Revelation 6. We're going to just read through real briefly Matthew 24. Because after he talks about the beginning of sorrows, verse 9 says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So people's sin, their iniquity is going to get worse and worse and worse. And as a result of that, you know, people's love is going to wax cold. And people are just, just more, the more engulfed in sin people are, the less loving they are. I mean, the more they're thinking about themselves, the less they're thinking about other people. Uh, that's just a fact. So this is also going to be a sign of the times that, that people are just, iniquity is abounding. Right? There's, there's more false prophets. There's people just, just preaching false gospels, leading people away. There's a great falling away of people from serving Christ. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about that. And then, um, so it's Matthew 24, the same thing. Verse 12, or verse 13, excuse me. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. 
and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So this is where we actually get the term, the great tribulation. And where people, if people are talking about the tribulation, this is where it's coming from. This is, this is the terminology that's referring to what everybody's going to know as the great tribulation, because this is where it's found. It's not found other places. Um, there are not, not that other portions of the Bible don't reference the same time frame, but the terminology of the great tribulation is coming from here. People, it's interesting, and, and you, know, you could dismantle, and I want to take all the time this morning either to dismantle the pre-tribulation rapture, but they speak out of both sides of their mouths. You got to try to pin people down if they're going to teach you, and, and you know, if you're unsure about this, you know, ask someone who knows the pre tribulation rapture and try to get try to get them nailed down on where they're getting the terminology from and explain it all in detail. Because most people can't do it. And you gotta be able to to ask the questions. Well, if this is talking about this, then if you're getting your terminology of the great tribulation, is this really a great tribulation? Then why in the same exact passage when you go down to verse number 29, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, if that doesn't sound like a rapture of the gathering together of believers, and I don't know what does, okay? And it says it's after the tribulation. And what tribulation? Well, the tribulation that's referenced is the great tribulation that has not been around ever and never will be. It's, it's, it's a unique thing. There's always been trials. There's always been persecutions. There's always been tribulations. But this is a great tribulation. This is greater than anything that's ever been on the planet ever and ever will be. This tribulation is unique. After the tribulation is when Jesus Christ comes back in the cloud. So if you have someone who believes that Jesus Christ is going to come back before the great tribulation, where does the scripture say that is the question. Where does it say that? So let's go to where the Bible talks about the great tribulation. Well, you're going to have to go to Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or Luke 21, right? Parallel passages. You're, that's where you're going to have to go to see these events laid out. But in that passage, in context, it talks about him coming after the tribulation. So where can you find this teaching? The problem is you can't. Because the, the pre-tribulation doctrine has to jump around and piece together scriptures in a way that's not normal and natural of just studying the Bible and taking it for what it says. It is forcing doctrine that doesn't exist. We need to be able to look at the Word of God and take it for what it says. You start with the surface meanings and then you start going deeper, but what's written on the surface has to be true. You can't say, oh, well, what do you say? You know, God is not the author of confusion. And you can't just start saying, well, we're jumping around in time here and this is talking to these people, and this is talking to these people. He's preaching to his disciples when they ask the question. He, like, he's giving them an answer. Is he just... I mean, they have to wait and wait thousands of years before anyone could even understand this, even though he's telling them, hey, I don't want anyone to deceive you. He's saying, I don't want anyone to deceive you, but you're going to need, you're going to need all kinds of experts for you to figure out what I'm even saying here. No, God is using a common language. Jesus is using, you know, he, he's, he's teaching. Now, when he spoke, he's not even speaking to the masses with this portion of scripture, because you could say, oh, you know, but he spoke in parables unto the people and sometimes he spoke in parables so that they wouldn't understand what he was saying and he would say dark sayings, but never with his disciples, never with those people. He was always expounding and saying, well, to you it is to know, you know, it is for you to know. 
And he's always expounding unto them more clearly and making sure they understand. Hey, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get this? And giving them just the, the honest, complete truth. Not that he wasn't honest, but it's just, you know, he's spelling it out for his disciples. Which is exactly what he's doing here. We have to take that approach and not start chopping up these passages. And say, oh, well, that's not really what he's talking about. Yeah, of course it is. It's, it's in the same, <laughs> the same chapter. It's all in context. We have to look at it that way. So these events we see happening. Now, th there's key moments that tie Scripture together. So when you study these subjects, you need, you need to keep a list of these key events to help you build the big picture of what's happening. Key events... One, it's, 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 it, you know, it's uh, specified very clearly here in Matthew 24 and verse 15 when he's talking about the abomination of desolation and he says this is the one that Daniel talked about. So you can find the abomination that Dan, you know, of desolation that Daniel talked about. You can find the abomination of desolation here in Matthew 24 and you can tie this in with these other events. Also the sun and moon being darkened and the stars not giving their light, falling from heaven. That is another huge event. It's monumental. So when you're going to look in passages in 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 Corinthians 15, you're going to look in Revelation, you know, on and on, 5 through the end of the chapter, you're going to look at these events, you're going to try to figure out, well, what is everything going to be like? It all has to harmonize, but those are key events that they do, they're not duplicated, they're not replicated. And a great tribulation, the Bible says here, this is one, it's nothing like anything before, and it's nothing that's going to come after it. So you can't say there's, well, maybe there's multiple tribulations. There's one. There's one. And I think the biggest problem that pre-tribulational believers have is that they have it in their mind that the tribulation lasts for seven years. But you cannot define that from Scripture. Show me, you know, just, just ask people. They're trying to tell you. See, people take these things because they've heard it over and over again. You take it as fact. Have it be proven to you from Scripture. Show me that the tribulation is seven years. I believe in a seven-year time frame of events that happen, but you cannot show me that that whole seven years is, is termed or coined anywhere as being the tribulation. Because what we have is, in the middle of that time, when that after the tribulation, when Jesus comes back, like Matthew 24 says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together as elect from the four winds from one hand of heaven to the other. And we see people being caught up together with him in the air. And then is when the wrath is going to be poured out. So, Revelation chapter 6. Because after the God takes his people out, just like he took Noah out of the world before he sent his wrath and destruction through the flood. He took the believers out and then, and then you know, um, destroyed the rest of the world. Same thing with uh, Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot was saved out of the city before God's wrath came on the city. Uh, it's going to be the same way. And that's why those two events are referenced in these passages saying, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the, the, the coming of the Son of Man. And, you know, in those days, as well as in the end times, people are marrying, giving a marriage. Life is just continuing. Yes, there's these other things going on. We have beginning of sorrows, but life is still continuing all the way up to the point when Jesus Christ comes back, which is another thing to understand. I mean, you may have a doom and gloom scenario of just everything, the whole world being in tatters when Jesus comes back, but life is still going to be continuing. Now, it's going to be bad for believers because believers are going to be persecuted and, and you know, um, being martyred and killed. But the world 
at large, the world in general that's rejecting Christ and taking the mark of the beast and everything else, they're just going to be continuing on life as normal. They're not going to be persecuted like the believers are. So for them, life's going to continue, right? Day to day. Um, so again, another thing just to be thinking about of what the world is going to be like when Jesus Christ comes back. Well, the world's going to keep doing what it's doing even in the midst of, of some of these things. But that's until God starts pouring out his wrath. And see, we're not here for the wrath. We're here for the tribulation part. We're here while the world is still kind of continuing. Yeah, there's going to be some earthquakes. There's going to be some pestilence. There's going to be some other things. But that's not even what we're focusing on. And that's not what Jesus focused on when he told his disciples what to look for. We told him to watch. He said, that's just the beginning of sorrows. He really spent a lot more time talking about the false Christ, talking about not being deceived, and, um, the, great, and the great tribulation that was going to come. Not the precursor of the tribulation, but the actual great tribulation is what he spent his time focusing on. Revelation chapter 6, we have the Lamb opening up the, the seven seals. Okay, And this is the order of events in order from seal 1 to seal 6 here, where we have the, um, the, tribul or the, excuse me, the rapture. This gives us a great timeline of what we can expect when the tribulation starts, because it starts with, uh, with, I believe, the first seal here. Revelation chapter 6, verse number 1, the Bible reads, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So he, this, is, this is a war. I mean, you've got somebody going forth and conquering lands. Because of this, I think this is also the reason why Jesus said not to freak out when there's war, because there's going to be wars. So we're not, I don't think we're going to be able to know for sure that the tribulation has started because someone's conquering and to conquer. Because we know that that's going to happen anyways. But this does kick off the tribulation. So I don't think we're going to know at the onset that it is the onset. There's going to be a point where we know we are in the tribulation. And those are based on some of the specific milestones, like the abomination of desolation being set up. Then you can know for sure that you are in the, the great tribulation. But we'll probably know even prior to that, just based on events that are happening. Um, but the, the very first seal is the white horse and there's someone, you know, there's a guy going out conquering. It's a leader. He's got a crown, right? He's a ruler and he's conquering and conquering. We see the same exact thing happening in Daniel, right? In the prophecies in Daniel, there's, there's the, the king of the north and the king of the south. And we've got these battles going on um, in Daniel. Verse number three says, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So again, more war. He's taking peace from the earth. Verse five, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So this is talking about famine. This is talking about, you know, extreme prices on food. And the, the reason why you're going to have extreme prices on food is because there's a, la there's a food supply shortage, right? It's... it's you have supply and demand, very simply. I mean, obviously, it can be manipulated potentially, but what, what's going to happen is that there's going to be, when it says a measure of wheat for a penny, a measure is just, I mean, it's just like a small measure, a small amount of wheat. Just imagine putting some wheat in your hands. He said, that's for a penny. Well, a penny is an entire day's wage in the Bible. So if you work for a whole day just to get just a, just a little bit of food, just enough to, to get by just for that day, right? You work for a whole day, just to provide enough food for you to eat, for you to eat that day. And imagine trying to share that with other people, right? That, that, that's, a, that's a major famine that is, uh, 
that is happening here in verse number six. And then it says, three measures of barley for a penny. So again, the same, the same type of, of thing. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So it's only going to affect the, these food, these grains, but not everything. Uh, verse seven says, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, these are the first four seals, first the, the four horsemen, okay? Uh, I think these happen consecutively, which is why he says the first seal, the second seal. I think these are going to happen in order. But what we see is a lot of war. So we have war with the first seal, more war with the second seal, right? Peter's just kind of taken from the earth. So it seems to start off with, with a leader kind of going forth. And, and if you look back in history, you could see why maybe Christians in different time eras might have thought, hey, maybe things are starting now. You think of like Adolf Hitler was someone who, who had this great expansionist idea and, and kind of started off in invading other countries and kind of bringing them under his domain and had this idea of going forth and conquering and to conquer. And then you had this great world war, right, where, where peace is taken from the earth because basically everyone's involved in, in a war. These are things that are playing out. If I were alive during that time as a Christian, I would probably be looking at this going, well, wow, what are, we, are we started now? Is this the beginning of the, uh, the Great Tribulation? And I don't think, you know, obviously hindsight's 2020, but as we see these specific events, you can go, well, maybe. Now, I don't think they saw the famine that's listed here. So that would be one thing you can say, okay, well, this has to happen in order for this to be true. Um, but these are the types of events we're going to see as these seals are opened in the tribulation. And it says, um, of course, the fourth seal is just a continuation of even, of even more death, essentially. It's whether it be from the sword, like a, like a warfare type of a thing, or just by hunger, um, just people dying and, and the beasts you know, killing people as well. So those, this is just a lot of death. And it's, and, it's, and it's a real lot of death because it says that it was given over the fourth part of the earth. So however you decide to interpret that, that's, that's a lot. Uh, verse number nine then says, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, at this point, this fifth seal is when it makes mention of people who are saved, right? People who are, uh, obviously they're saved because they're appearing in heaven under the altar of God. So they're there where John is witnessing all this stuff and they were slain for the word of God. So obviously there's a great persecution against believers, people who they're slain because they believe the Bible, because they believe on Jesus Christ. That's why they're killed and for the testimony which they held. So this is extreme persecution, enough for John to see this at the fifth seal. Like, wow, there's all these people here. And it says in verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So obviously they just came out of suffering a great persecution because they're all saying unto God, God, avenge our blood. I mean, we've just been wiped out and it's a large group of people. This isn't like one or two people. This is a huge group of people that's appearing in heaven of being slaughtered, being killed for the word of God. And keep your place here in Revelation 6 and turn to Revelation 13. Revelation 13 describes these people that appear in heaven and going, hey, how long is it going to be before you avenge our blood? Revelation 13, verse number one, the Bible reads, And I saw, and I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. 
And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So what we saw in Revelation 1, the, 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 the white horse and someone sitting on the white horse going forth, conquering and to conquer, and he had this crown, I believe that's the Antichrist. That's who's going forth to conquer and conquer. And you know, I didn't mention this before we went over that in Revelation 6, but we see in the Bible when Jesus Christ comes back, he's riding on a white horse, right? And it has on his thigh, Lord of Lord, King of Kings, and he's coming forth conquering and conquer. The Antichrist is trying to imitate Jesus Christ, which is why he comes on a white horse. He's trying to come in as if he's the Savior. He's, you know, the, the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's this Messiah figure coming to save the world. But he goes, comes forth conquering and to conquer, and again, you can tie that in here with this man receiving a deadly wound and then his deadly wound is healed and he's, you know, like coming, like being brought back to life, so to speak. I think it's, it's again, this mimicry of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, right? His coming back to life and, and this imposter trying to be like Jesus Christ in every way that he can and trying to convince people to worship him. So... This is who we see coming. And then in verse five, it says, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months, 40 and two months, three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in, the, in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Saints are people who are sanctified in the blood of Jesus Christ. You're a saint if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. So he's given to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So he's given the power to be able to overcome the saints. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So he basically becomes the ruler of the world. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of, li of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This war against the saints this is great tribulation. This is where believers are being executed and murdered for the word of God. This is the event that we see of these people showing up in Revelation 6 going, hey, God, aren't you going to avenge our blood? Right? And God tells them to wait. We haven't gotten there yet in Revelation 6, but God basically tells them to wait and hold off a minute. Why? Because power was given unto him to go out and, and, and is allowed to kill the saints. It's all for a greater purpose. There is a reason for it, which is why God is still saying, well, hold on a minute. The time isn't ready just yet. Okay. But th these, these events all match up perfectly with what we see happening. Verse number, let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. And keep, you keep replacing Revelation 13. I know it's not that far away, but um, Revelation 6 says, in verse 11, and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So remember when I said that we need to be on the lookout for these, these pivotal events, these, these, these events that happen in other parts of Scripture that's going to help us understand where everything fits together. This is one of those events of the great earthquake, the sun becoming black, and the moon turning to blood. We see the same thing in Matthew 24. Okay, This happens at the sixth seal, when that event happens. That happens in Matthew 24 after the tribulation. Make sense? So in Matthew 24, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Okay. That happens at the sixth seal in Revelation 6.12, which would imply that Everything up to that point is the tribulation, right? I mean, if, if, if Matthew 24 is saying that event happens after the tribulation, 
Everything else happens during the tribulation. That is the tribulation. So people being martyred for the, for the cause of Christ and this, this great persecution and the, and the, the specific, the Antichrist rot coming into power and, and waging war and these great deaths and the famines that are going to happen as a result of all this war uh, is, is all part of the great tribulation. But then the tribulation ends when the sun and moon darken, and then when the elect are caught up into heaven. Now, the abomination of desolation was another event that is mentioned. Let's go back to Revelation 13, because Revelation 13 starts off describing one beast, right? It describes this, what I believe to be the Antichrist, and then in Revelation 13, it continues on to talk about the, the abomination of desolation. Verse 11, the Bible reads, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So this is the second beast that he's observing. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and, and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. This is a false prophet that's coming and telling all the people, hey, worship the Antichrist. Worship this guy. Look, and this guy has his own powers and these miracles, but he's saying you need to worship him. So he's guiding the people to him. This is like, uh, you know, Satan's version of, a, of maybe a John the Baptist trying to point to Jesus Christ. This is his own, you know, uh, messenger to, to point people to the Antichrist. And they're all getting their power from the devil. Just like Jesus Christ got his power from, from the Lord, from, from God, from the Holy Ghost. And John the Baptist is pointing people to Christ. The devil has his own mock, mockery or, or his own version of this through, uh, through these various people. So verse 15 says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now, there's a lot of things that are written here, and I don't, I don't have time to just get into everything. Obviously, it's a big subject. It's easy to see how a lot of these things can start to play out. We can see that we're close to the, I mean, closer now than ever before, right? We, could, we can see that we're close to the things. We could start to see how these things can actually be implemented now, too. Um, it may have been harder for people. Like, how can you not buy or sell? Well, if you take away all cash and just everything becomes meaningless, and the only way you can do business is maybe digitally, through a device that needs to be, you know, stamped on you, implanted in you, in your hand, in your forehead. You know, we could see easily the technology is already available today to do these types of things. And getting the power structure in place to really enforce this and to be able to go after people who are not taking the mark. Um, it, the writings on the wall, we see the events, but what we still know from all of this is what do we look for? We know there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, but we also know that the very first seals have to do with someone going forth, conquering and conquer. Like I said, we may not know right away that it's the Antichrist. I don't think we will. When the Antichrist actually comes into power and starts these wars and starts conquering, I don't think we're going to be able to know that, that that person is the Antichrist because of the fact that, well, we know that there is wars and we know nation rises against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So we can't necessarily know that for sure. But as we get into this, you know, the, the, the pestilences, the, the earthquakes, those are all beginnings of sorrow. That's going to be a precursor. But when we're really going to know is when the persecution just ramps up against believers. That's when you're going to know okay, we're, we are in this. 
and uh, especially as you start to see things unfold, you know, someone may be receiving a deadly wound, it's healed, that's when I think everyone is going to get on board with the Antichrist and people who were skeptical of him and people who just aren't maybe even religious are going to go, wow, maybe there's something to this and I think that's what's going to give him just that overwhelming power of people kind of coming on board to, and, and you know, whatever lying signs and wonders and miracles that he's doing. Those are the things we really got to be on the lookout for. Watch out for the false Christ and the, and the, the false prophets and these things to happen. There's going to be other events that happen. We're not, you know, at, like I said, at the most, we could be maybe in the beginnings of sorrows. I still don't feel like we've seen enough other things to even really warrant that yet. Um, just because there's one event. Uh, you know, people like turning to the blood moons and stuff. That's just ridiculous because it's not just a red moon that you're going to see. It's the sun becoming black, a sackcloth of hair, and the stars falling from it. Like, that's a major event. That's not these regular occurrences that happen on a, on a regular basis, on a scheduled basis. That's part of, of the way God made everything, right? Those all may be these little foreshadowings, but it's not what is being described here. Uh, and I'm talking about you know, the blood moons or whatever. People write books on it and, and try to set dates and everything according to these blood moons that happen. No, these are major events. So all of that to say this, you know, hopefully you could learn a little bit and, and study this out on your own. It's really interesting material because it hasn't happened yet. But at the end of the day, we have nothing to fear. We know what's going to happen. Even martyrdom, even knowing that there's going to be a great tribulation and a persecution and people are going to be killed for the cause of Christ. Obviously, there's, you know, on one hand, you're not looking forward to that. No one likes to, to have to go through some things. But it, does, it is going to make it easier knowing, well, this is what's going to happen. And knowing the end and getting yourself strengthened in advance, you may be one of those, because the Bible says that for the elect's, day, the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened, and those that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So by knowing this, by studying this, by being right with God, God may allow you to make it through that tribulation time without having to be killed for his sake and, and being able to make it all the way to actually see Jesus Christ come back. He may reward you that way by knowing and being strengthened, being ready for it, instead of going, oh man, what's going on? And then you end up getting killed because you have no clue what's going on, right? And, and whereas some, maybe some weaker Christians or, or, or more ignorant Christians that don't know, as, you know, that haven't been watching and haven't been um, walking with the Lord or whatever, maybe that's the case for them. I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's speculation on my part, but at least we could know. Either way, having the knowledge is important because you can make sure then to, to stay strong and say, oh, at, at the very least, you can know this. When things get that bad, the time's not going to be that long. <laughs> the time is short. The days are going to be numbered and just say, okay, well, let's just make this final push. Let's just go this final effort because Jesus is coming back soon. And let's just work as hard as we can now because our time is so short. So when you do see these things start to happen, know that the time is at hand and that Jesus is going to be coming back soon. So that's the, the hope that we have. The hope is the return of Jesus Christ, right? So, so not to have a defeated mindset. Yeah, but there's people dying all over the place. Yeah, but Jesus is coming back really, really soon. Right? So don't run away. Don't get scared. Don't fear. Don't, don't, don't flee. Stand strong and, and do as many great exploits as you can because you will get rewarded for that. And, and how great for Jesus Christ to come back and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Right? You, just, you, you stuck through to the very end. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, giving us this information that you don't want us to be deceived, that you've given us the truth, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to be strengthened by the truth and to um, get firm in our walk with you and, and help us to be able to show other people uh, the great truths from your word. Help us to lead other people to Christ. God, we thank you uh, for loving us and for dying for us, dear Lord, and for, for paying for our sins. Lord, help us to, uh, to do what's right. And please 
continue to, to open up our understanding and give us some more knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.